the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which, with which I have ever offended, offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your, your beloved, beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be, to be gracious, gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The introit is Psalm 33. Let us read responsively. Shout for joy in the Lord. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. Let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord forever stands. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out. On all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all. And observes all their deeds. A king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death, and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him, because <clears throat> we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us. Even as we hope in you.
The Lord be with you. And with thy Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is by your grace that we live as your people who offer acceptable sacrifice. Grant that we may walk by faith and not by sight in the way that leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Old Testament reading is from Genesis, the 15th chapter. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him lack nothing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them. The epistle reading is from Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore, 
These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn and yet God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But God, who clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow, is thrown, thrown into the oven. How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old with treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. This is the gospel of the Lord. Having heard the word of God, let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe, I believe in one, one God, God, the Father Almighty, Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and, and in one, one Lord Jesus Christ, Christ the, the only begotten, begotten Son of God, begotten, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, the light of light, very God of very God, Begotten, begotten, not made, being, being of one, one substance with, with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for, for us men and, and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin, Virgin Mary, Mary, and was made man, and, and was, was crucified, crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the, the third day he rose again according, according to the Scriptures, and ascended, ascended into heaven, and sits, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again, come again with glory God, to judge, judge both, both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And, and I believe, believe in the Holy Spirit, Spirit the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the epistle reading for today, and let us listen to two verses once again just to remind us of what, was, what we heard in the epistle reading. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. This is our text. Dear redeemed in Christ, faith is an important topic. Why is faith an important topic? Because everyone on earth lives by faith. Everyone lives by their personal beliefs, whether religious or not. We Christians live by faith in the word of Christ. Therefore, it is important to continually deepen and refresh our understanding of faith, the kind of faith that we learn from God's word. And the 11th chapter of Hebrews does this for us. It gives us the most impressive treatment of faith in the entire book of Hebrews. And some commentators say perhaps in the entire Bible. This chapter begins with a definition of faith. We heard these words. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. According to this, faith is the assurance in the heart that the things we hope for will actually be realized. It is the conviction of the mind by which we grasp things that are not seen, that are not visible. So then what should we be hoping for? And what are the things not seen that we know by faith? The things hoped for are the things that God has promised to us, not things that we make up. The things that we hope for are the things that God has promised to us. And the things not seen are the things that God's word reveals to us and we apprehend those things not seen by faith. We know that if God promises something, it most certainly will come to pass. And God has promised to us, he's promised to the world, salvation in Christ Jesus. And that salvation is not yet fully realized. It will be fully realized on the last day in the resurrection of the body to everlasting life. But now that salvation is apprehended by faith. By faith in this promise of salvation, we have peace of heart now, and we have a forward look toward that day when the promise will be fully realized in the resurrection. And because of this peace, we press forward daily toward that wonderful hope, that wonderful destination. Also, if God reveals something to us in his word, it is most certainly true. And the example used by the writer to the Hebrews here is the example of creation. We heard in the reading, by faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things visible. In other words, the Almighty who created all things is able to fulfill all his promises to us. And so we see these wonderful promises of salvation and everlasting life have been made and revealed to us by him who created all things, who in his almighty power is able to bring them to pass and to fulfill his promises. Promises can only be received by faith. We know that even from our everyday life. If somebody writes you a check, what is that? That's a promise. And the only way you can cash that check is if you believe it's good. Promises are received by faith. And in the Christian faith, the pattern is like this. God's promise is given, and that promise creates faith in the heart. And faith's response to that promise brings the response of good fruits. And so we understand it like this. God's word creates faith, and faith, faith 
brings forth fruits that are fitting and acceptable to God himself. To strengthen us in understanding this passage in Hebrews, the book sets before us the power and the wonders of Christian faith through the example of those who have gone before us. And it does this to strengthen the faithful on their journey through this earthly life. It enables us to overcome our sins and builds endurance as we pass, as we press on day by day on this journey through this valley of the shadow of death. The example of our forefathers in their faith journey bears witness to the power and the blessings obtained by faith. This faith enables us to live the daily life of repentance by which we lay aside our guilt and sin, which clings so closely to us, and this faith empowers us to receive the promise of forgiveness and so strengthens us to run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. First then, let us remind ourselves that this passage addresses the faithful first. Without knowing and believing in the Christian faith, this passage is meaning, meaningless. It can be interpreted in many different ways. One of the ways is it's been used as a lesson in motivational teaching. You know, things like, just believe in yourself and you can do anything you want to. Or, if you have a strong enough faith, your hopes and dreams will come true and so on. That's not the Christian faith. It might be useful in earthly things, but it's a man made faith. The Christian faith is not man-made. God, through his word and Holy Spirit, creates the Christian faith in the hearts of his people. Remember Romans chapter 10? There the Spirit teaches, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's the principle. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God, not our will. God, not our strength. God, not our intellect, creates faith in the heart. And he does it by pow the power of his word. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. It is as the Apostle John writes in the first chapter of his gospel. He says this, But as many as received Christ Jesus, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Who created the faith in the hearts of those people and gave them the power to become the sons of God? Didn't come from themselves, didn't come from flesh and blood. It came from the word of God delivered to them. And so here we see that the power to believe is a gift of God. A few chapters later in the Gospel of John, Jesus says this, Truly, truly, I say to you, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And the lesson here is, is of our own strength, we are not even able. Cannot means not able. It doesn't mean you're prohibited. It means you're not able to enter the kingdom of, of God of your own will or your own strength. None of us can do that. We enter the kingdom of God only by the miracle of the new birth. The new birth is a great miracle, which works God's, God's, which works by the power of God's word and his Holy Spirit. The small catechism explains it like this. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. So it is truly a miracle. It is a new birth. A person cannot born themselves. It has to be of God. He comes to us with his word 
creates faith in his heart, in our hearts, and we become a new person. And all this is very, very comforting. It shows us that the faith in our hearts is not man-made. It is the work of God. Anything that is man-made is subject to all manner of weaknesses and error and failure, which do not lead to confidence and comfort in spiritual matters. But not so with God. His word and spirit cannot fail. It is his word and spirit that creates, refreshes, and sustains the faith in our hearts for this earthly journey. So the question comes, how do I know that I have this faith? How do I know that it has been created in my heart? And that is an important question. Because if we don't get that answer right, we might end up trying to create a man-made faith in our own hearts. So how do we know we have this faith? The Apostle Paul answers in 1 Corinthians saying, Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. Let's listen to that again. No man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit. What he's saying there, it is impossible to say from the heart, Jesus is Lord of our own will and strength. But when we say from the heart and confess with the lips, Jesus is Lord, that is not our strength speaking. That is faith speaking. Faith that has been worked by the Holy Spirit himself through the word of Christ. And so in this way, we know with confidence and conviction that the true faith is the faith in our hearts. This faith needs nurture, and it needs refreshment. And in order to refresh and strengthen our faith, the faith which each of us has been given, our text calls to witness the faith of our forefathers. We hear from the reading that by faith, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, the ancients received their commendation. And those people are people like Adam and Noah, Abraham, Sarah, and a whole catalog of those who believed before us. So again, the text says, by faith, the people of old received their commendation. Well, what commendation did they receive? And from whom did they receive it? The commendation came from no less than God himself. The commendation is God's approval and acceptance of their life. Let us take a look at a few examples of the forefathers set before us in today's reading. Now, we don't have time to go through the whole list of forefathers. That would probably take us almost all day. Uh, so let us take a closer look at a few of them, namely Abel, Noah, and Abraham. Remember the brothers Cain and Abel, the two sons of Adam and Eve? Both of them worshiped God and brought sacrifices to God. Cain brought offerings from his fields. Abel brought offerings from his flocks, both fine and expensive offerings. And then we know what happened. The Lord had respect unto Abel and his offering. But to Cain and his offering, he had no respect. Isn't that interesting? Both addressing God, both bringing very fine offerings, but one is received and one is literally rejected. That's the force of the Hebrew word there in Genesis. The Lord... So what, what made the difference? What made the difference? And the answer came in our Hebrews text for today. The answer is faith. In our lesson today, we heard the answer, and this is it. By faith, Abel offered a, to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was con commended as righteous. By faith, his offering was acceptable. 
the Lord considered Abel to be a righteous man. Well, what kind of faith had this kind of power to make a sacrifice like that acceptable to the Lord? The Lord needs not our sacrifices. He owns everything in the world and in the universe. But this became a precious sacrifice in his sight. And the answer that we were given is because of faith. So we have to ask, what kind of faith was that? From childhood, both boys had been taught that Christ was coming into the world to crush the head of Satan. Here is the verse. This is all the way back in Genesis 3, before Cain and Abel were born. The Lord said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Some translations say, he shall crush your head and you shall crush his heel. The seed of the woman is the Messiah. The seed of the woman there in that passage is God's Christ. In that passage, God promised that when Messiah, that is the Christ, should appear, he would deal a fatal wound to Satan. A crushed head is a fatal wound. Christ Jesus dealt that fatal blow through his perfect obedience and his sacrificial death on the cross. His obedience and his death was done on our behalf that we might benefit from it. And the benefit is that he took all the sin and guilt of the world away took the sin of us all away. And without guilt and sin, Satan's power collapses. It's crushed. Satan's only real power is that of the accuser. And with sin and guilt taken away, that power is crushed because you cannot accuse an innocent man. And Christ's absolution, Christ's forgiveness, takes away our sins and makes us innocent before God. Anyone who believes that, anyone who believes that Christ has indeed taken away the sin of the world, has become a righteous person in God's sight. This is what we have believed, and that is why we count ourselves righteous, not according to our works, but according to our faith, not according to the law, but according to the gospel. We have put our faith in Christ to daily deliver us from our sins and from our guilt. And so with sin removed from our account, God counts us righteous in his sight and our sacrifice is done in faith. Our, our love towards our neighbor, whatever we do in charity, in faith, becomes acceptable in his sight. And so it was with Abel. He believed the promise that Christ would someday appear and fulfill the promise that the Lord had made, the promise that the power of Satan would be crushed. In other words, faith in the Messiah made Abel righteous. God then declared him righteous by respecting his offering. And so again, we see the pattern of faith is this. The promise of forgiveness in the Messiah created faith in Abel's heart. Because of that faith, the Lord declared or commended Lord declared, able to be a righteous man. The fruit of that faith was to return thanks to the Lord. Because of faith in Christ, this faith in Christ motivated Abel's offering. His sacrifice was pleasing to the Lord. Our faith is exactly the same as Abel's. We believe that Jesus of Nazareth is that promised Messiah. Jesus of Bethlehem is that promised Christ. He is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. That faith, whoever holds that faith, has become righteous and acceptable to God. The only difference is this. The appearance of Christ to, the, <clears throat> to our forefathers was in the form of a promise. For Abel, Christ was in the form of a promise. But for us, it is a promise fulfilled. For we know that it was fulfilled in that baby of Bethlehem. In him was the fulfillment of the ancient promise. And we believe that, that same, we believe in that same Christ that Abel believed in. And it is the same with Noah 
and Abraham. They heard the word of Christ, they believed it, and God counted that faith to their account as righteousness. God declared Noah to be a righteous man. How so? All men are sinners. Noah was a sinner. We can read through the accounts of his life and we see there was sin in Noah's life. Yet God calls him a righteous man. How so? Well, this is the wonder of us all. God came to set, God sent his son not to destroy sinners, but to rescue them. Noah's righteousness was the righteousness of faith, not works. He heard the word of the promised Christ. He believed the word of the promised Christ. He believed in Christ's forgiveness and reconciliation. That word created the correct faith in his heart. And that faith produced a life pleasing to God. God testified to Noah's righteousness of faith, commending him to all people as a righteous man. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 6. And likewise with Abraham. God counted Abraham to be a righteous man. How so? Again, by faith. You can read Abraham's life, and you can as well see in his life sins, just like we can see in each of our own lives. Yet God calls him a righteous man. And again, it's by faith. God promised a great promise to Abraham. He promised that the Messiah, that is the Christ, would be a descendant of Abraham's. Today in the Old Testament reading, we heard that Abraham in his old age was still without child. The promise hadn't been fulfilled and he was way beyond having children. At his age, there was humanly no possibility of having a child. However, the Lord appeared to Abraham and renewed the promise, refreshed his faith, that Christ would indeed be, would descend from his lineage. So Abraham asks, what will you give me so that seeing that I go childless? And the Lord replied, Abraham, look toward the heaven and tell the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Abraham, even in his advanced age, believed that promise of the Lord, that very promise that he spoke to him that day in his old age. And by faith in this promise, God commends him as a righteous man. Because of that faith, God counted him as among the righteous. This is the testimony that God himself gives, the commendation that God himself gives to a few of our forefathers. God counts faith in Christ, in, in Christ Jesus in his forgiveness as true righteousness. Righteousness that brings forth a life that is acceptable to our Father in heaven. And so from these examples, the examples of our forefathers, God confirms and strengthens our faith, for it is the same as theirs. And because it is the same as theirs, the Lord counts our life, our offerings, our thanksgivings, our praises, our sacrifices, and so on, as acceptable and pleasing to him by faith those things become good and acceptable. So then we have to ask the Lutheran Catechism question, what does this mean? Here is the conclusion. It's written not in chapter 11 that we have in our bulletin. It's written in chapter 12. The first verse of chapter 12 is the conclusion to all of Chapter 11 in Hebrews. Listen to that first verse of chapter 12. Therefore, oh, what is the word therefore, therefore? It points back to what we have just heard. So because of what we've heard about our forefathers and their faithfulness, it says, therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run the endurance, look, excuse me, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. 
The cloud of witnesses are those who went before us, who God commended, whose lives God commended because of the true faith that resided in their hearts and was confessed by their lips and their life. By that faith, they realized both joy and by that faith, they were able to endure the tribulations that come to all in this life. And so the conclusion says, let us, like them, also walk by this faith, realizing the joy and run with endurance the race that is set before us. We accomplish this by looking daily to Jesus, who is the chief example and the chief provider of all that we need. To him, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. And so let us look, for, look to each day with hope and expectation in that faith. Because he who was promised will be with us. And we have Christ walking by our side. He who endured the cross so that we might have all these things. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let us pray. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, hear us. God the Father in heaven, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy. Be gracious to us, spare us, good Lord. Be gracious to us, help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death. Good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, <clears throat> by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Help us, good Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment. Help us, good Lord. We poor sinners implore you. To hear us, good Lord. To rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to, stand, to send faithful laborers into your harvest, 
and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. To raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. To give to all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend our president and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessings, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage and to have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. To forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts, to give and preserve for our use the kindly fruits of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. For all that are ill among us, O Father of all mercies and God of all comfort, our only help in time of need, look with favor upon your servants among us, suffering from illnesses. Assure them of your mercy, deliver them from the temptations of the evil one, and give them patience and comfort in this time of illness. If it please you, restore them to health, or give them grace to accept this tribulation with courage and hope. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, we implore you to hear us. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen. Proceed.
We continue with the service of the sacrament, beginning on page 194 at the preface. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is meet and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on this day, the first day of the week, overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
will give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. with you. And with Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.